presentations. Our first presenter is Kevin Clenard, and I will turn it over to him to tell you all about his capstone project. All right, let me switch over to my presentation. All right, hello everyone. My name is Kevin Clenard. Um, I'm currently a senior at Guilford High School, um, moving on to Boston U to study international relations. Um, and as for my project, I am talking about the uh, Greek bazooki and rebetiko, um, which is essentially the um, Greek blues. Um, now, why would I be playing the Greek bazooki? Um, I've been playing guitar for a few years as of now. I'm an avid fan of the um, American blues. Um, I've always loved a lot of music from this region, from uh, previous trips to Greece, as well as from living in Turkey for a year and a half. So a lot of this is uh, deeply ingrained within me. Um, I was really interested in the challenge of a foreign instrument. Um, and over the summer, I had the opportunity to do so with um, a trip to Corfu in August. So I thought this would be the perfect time to try my hand at it. Um, so my overall goal was to learn how to play the Greek bazooki and learn about a lot of the history of Rebetiko, um, which is seldom known about outside of Greece. Um, and I overall accomplished this through um, countless lessons with my mentor, Konstantinos Ravelis, and um, individual research as well. So uh, as you can see, here is um, some pictures of me buying my bazooki in Greece over the summer from Vrionis Music Shop. Now, what is a bazooki? So, um, a bazooki itself, it has a Turkish origin um, in its name, uh, which was bazook, it means broken. And um, typically it's made from a variety of different woods, but mine is Greek walnut. Um, they all typically have a spruce top, as do most modern guitars. Um, there are two different varieties. There's a three course variety. Um, so that's gonna be three sets of doubled up strings, and that's tuned DAD. And then there's the four course variety, which is what I have. It's kind of more of the modern standard, um, which is tuned to CFAD. They often have intricate designs in mother of pearl or abalone and a floating bridge. And I'm just going to switch over. I can switch over mine. All right. So as you can see here, this is my bazooki. Um, a little bit of a lower end one. So this isn't any abalone. This is kind of more like sparkly looks to it. Um, here's the back, it's a bullback. Um, as you can see, it kind of has more of a classical headstock with the gear tuners. Um, and overall, you typically see the bazookis with a lot of this ornate decoration. Um, the floating bridge here, um, that's a little different than what you'd see on a guitar. Um, and it makes it a little harder to intonate, but it's just part of it. Um, mine, I also have a pickup installed that is common on a lot more of the modern ones. Um, especially starting with the 70s in which uh, people started using them a lot with psychedelic music, um, which was completely amplified. So now getting back to my presentation. Let's see. There we go. All right. So the history of the Greek bazooki itself, um, it has a lot of roots to ancient Greek uh, lute instruments, such as the uh, Pandora, which you can see in this photo on the top right. Um, and of course also lots of similarities to mandolins um, in that it has the doubled up strings. Um, it was played often in Turkey and um, kind of brought to Greece around 1920, especially with a large influx of refugees from Smyrna, modern day Izmir. Um, many immigrants also went to America bringing the bazooki and its music abroad as players and luthiers, which included Antony um, Stathopoulos, who was the founder of Epiphone. Um, and as for the bazooki itself, it was often considered criminal due to an associa association with Rodebetos, which I will get to later. And that brought about smaller versions such as the Zoras and the Bagomas, which could easily be hidden in prison or hidden under someone's coat. Um, now, what is the Rebetico itself? Uh, it is the music of the Rebetis, um, the rebellious, the disobedient of society. Um, it was often the music of the lower and middle classes and of the refugees from Asia Minor. Um, it has many parallels to the American blues, so it's often called the Greek blues, um, due to a lot of these connotations. Um, Rebetiko, um, as said by Benonis uh, Dimitri Anakis, was loved and adored by many because, of it, um, because it articulates the feelings of the people, the poverty, the disappointment, the despair, the happiness, the sadness, and the love, um, which can also be seen in
you know, of the lives of a lot of these people, whether that be just any situations in their lives or the hardships or anything of that sort. Now, to truly understand the history of uh, Rebetico itself, we have to understand the importance of the port cities, um, specifically in the cases of Smyrna, uh, which you can see right around here, uh, which is modern-day Izmir, Piraeus, which is the port city of Athens, and Thessaloniki up here. Uh, the port cities themselves are big financial centers, um, attracting many from smaller towns for work, um, often lower class workers. Um, there are hubs of cultural exchange just due to all the trade that comes in and out of those cities from all across the world. Um, and in addition to um, the fact that a lot of this area is considered the crossroads of the world between the Middle East and Europe, um, Greece itself is a Balkan country, but of course also deeply rooted um, with a lot more of the um, Middle East as well, given it was former Ottoman Empire. Um, a lot of this attracted not only legitimate workers, but also others such as smugglers, um, which gets more into the Rebetis lifestyle later on. And um, in a lot of these cities, you start to see early forms of Rebetico um, at a, uh, where Cafe Amans are present. Um, these were overall oriental style venues with both men and women, which was a little different from a lot of the others around the time, where it was typically only men. And um, this is typically where you started to see the beginning of this immoral music. Now, for Smyrna specifically, this is probably one of the most important. Um, after World War I and uh, the Turkish War of Independence, um, the Treaty of Lausanne was signed to kind of um, create a lot more peace in the region, especially in terms of borders after um, the Ottoman Empire fell. Um, and in this, a large popula um, population exchange took place in which um, a large number of Turks in uh, Greece went to Greece and um, vice versa with, Greece, with Greeks in Turkey. Um, in addition to this, um, as Turkish troops were closing in on Smyrna specifically, uh, the city was set on fire, creating a large refugee crisis and even further migration to Greece. Um, most of the fires were set in the Greek sectors of the city, um, and this ultimately forced a lot of them out of their previous homes. Many of them had only spoken Turkish their entire lives, so this is a major change for them as a whole. Um, for their new lives in Greece, Many of the refugees flocked to the other port cities of Thessaloniki and Piraeus, where huge refugee camps were set up. Uh, many who were originally well off in their old homes uh, became stricken with poverty and lived in the slums of these urban Greek cities. Um, and because of this, many also uh, brought their musical influences from Turkey, which um, helped to really further the creation of Rebetiko, along with the stories of their hardship from having to completely change their lives about. Um, and this was in addition to the refugees, as well as to a lot of the um, lower class citizens that you saw in a lot of these port cities. Now the Rebetas themselves, um, they were kind of a social class on their own. Due to the harsh conditions of both migrants and the already present lower class, um, some turned to crime for money, some confided in hashish, and many of them in music, uh, with kind of the Rebetas doing all three of these. Um, they turned to the bazooki um, as their form of music, due to a lot of the Turkish immigrants or rather Turkish Greek instrument um, immigrants bringing it over, uh, where they would often play it in hashtens, or um, in Greek called tekes. Um, within these hashtens, it really became a place for them to um, confide and kind of uh, find a place of refuge for themselves in these new cities. They were able to, of course, take their minds off with the shish and also with um, a lot of this music to kind of describe their hardships. Uh, these people themselves, though, were really looked down upon by most of traditional Greek society, including the more conservative of the lower class, as they were kind of seen as a marginalized group, kind of on the edge, morally questionable, um, due to some of the connotations with crime as well as with drugs. Uh, that brings us to Yanis Papayano. He was a bazooki virtuoso in himself, um, very important in the Rebetico movement. And um, in this passage right here, he describes... Um, really how looked down upon the bazooki and rebetico truly was around this time. Um, so as he says here, so I bought my first bazooki and took it home. God preserve his servant. My mother's reaction was terrifying. She started yelling and berating me to no end. Take it and leave it my home. Uh, leave, it, leave my home, you bum. Murderer. Disgusting creature. You dared bring a bazooki into this good house. Then take it and vanish with it from my sight. Indeed, she kicked me out of the house. A mother disowning her child because of a bazooki. Can you imagine this? as if it were a killing instrument, my poor beloved instrument, how much have you also not suffered with the rest of us? So as you can really see in this quote, um, people were really persecuted against um, to a degree for um, 
owning bazookas or for being associated with um, the Rebetis. Um, it was really a part of society that people did not want to be associated with for the most part. Um, now um, we move to America. Uh, around the same time, uh, refugees and immigrants uh, were coming to America, um, mostly in the early 20th century. Uh, and they, um, as an actual group, were heavily discriminated against by groups including the KKK, who did not view them as white. Of course, you saw this a lot with um, Italians and Irish from around the same time, too. Um, and during this time, the Greeks often found refuge in their music tradition, and many of the uh, first Greek recordings, um, specifically within the bazooki and um, with Rebetiko, were actually from the U.S. and were imported to Greece. One of the most important of these um, was through Columbia Records. Um, which is one of the big ones with that, and it was from Jack Gregory, also known as Ionis Halikias. Um, he recorded four tracks from 1932 to 1932, uh, 1933, which I've considered uh, some of the most important. One of these was Minore Tuteke, which is a minor key song from the Hashtan, and that's the one that made it to Greece. Um, this track that made it to Greece really popular is the Bazuki Rebetiko, and the recording of its music throughout Greece. Um, it created a whole explosion for the most part. It kind of really showed people what people can really do with this Bazuki. Um, and this is uh, Jack Gregory himself, as you can see, New York's Bazooki pioneer in the early 1930s. And as you can see here, this is the record, uh, which became an important uh, part of the actual uh, Rebetico movement. And that brings us to Marcos Bambacaris. Um, he appeared around the same time um, as Jack Gregory in terms of Bazooki. Um, he was originally from Sirius, uh, from Syros, sorry. Uh, but fled to Piraeus when he was 12, thinking the police were waiting for him at home. Uh, during this time, he worked a lot of lower class jobs, such as in a slaughterhouse, before um, he ultimately fell, uh, fell in love with the bazooki. Um, and this, of course, was due to uh, most of his life being spent um, in kind of these lower class neighborhoods in the port city with a lot of the refugees. Uh, he soon became a master of the instrument as he played in Heshishtans and uh, beyond, uh, to where he eventually started. Uh, getting the chance to record, um, along with the whole movement with Jack Gregory. Uh, he popularized the use of the bazooki uh, with his first record, which made a complete shift in the Greek music industry. Um, originally, the violin and guitar were uh, the biggest instruments, um, but then the bazooki really started to take over after Bambakadis. Um, additionally, when Marcos Bambakadis um, published his first gramophone record in 1933, the number of gramophones in Greece went from 300, to four, uh, 300 or 400 to around 7,000 to 8,000. So he had a huge um, influence on the overall um, music world of Greece. As you can see, here's a picture of him uh, with his bazooki. And uh, next, this brings us to a lot of censorship. Uh, due to a lot of its criminal connotations, um, the bazooki itself was often um, a sign of criminality. Uh, so. Uh, people would often get arrested for it. And this especially started um, happening around 1936 under Metaxas, who was a Greek dictator, um, taking part in the fascist movement of Europe at the same time. Um, he uh, had a lot of these uh, songs censored for uh, typically sexual and drug references, which was um, very common in a lot of these songs uh, due to his more conservative values. Um, additionally, for points of humor and sarcasm as well. Um, and a lot of this was in the name of modernization. Um, during this movement, he really wanted to make Greece a very Western country, and he wanted to completely cut ties with anything considered Eastern, such as uh, Rebetiko. They kind of saw it as inferior. Um, Rebetiko's songs as well, from earlier periods, often had a lot of political criticisms, um, which of course an authoritarian regime is not going to like. Um, and this kind of brought around a huge change for the Rebetiko movement. At this time, you started seeing a lot of self-censorship for artists as they began to compose their new music, um, just so they could, of course, still publish it out to the um to the people um otherwise um often the robotic artists would uh, become persecuted um they would be arrested and the police would smash their instruments um and uh yeah that was a huge problem during this time um but of course some did con uh, continue on the original robotic tradition just um they just didn't publish it until later on uh later on you saw uh, continuing political issues. In 1941, the Nazis started to occupy Greece, and during this time, all the recording studios were closed down completely. So, um, during this time, you didn't really see any new releases of Marbetico songs until after the war. Um, 
while not recorded, these artists continued to write these songs though and were popular underground as a sign of resistance. Um, then right after uh, the Nazi occupation, he had the Greek Civil War from 1946 to 1949. Both of these drastically increased poverty in Greece um, for basically all of the uh, different classes, uh, which led to a lot more popularity in the genre, but uh, due to a lot of the self-censorship, it was often in a much less controversial form. So that brings us to Vasily Tsitsanis, another bazooki virtuoso. Um, he was inspired by the Rebetiko music of the time, and uh, he, pick up, he picked up the bazooki because of that. Um, he appeared as a player and was recorded around 1937 at first. Um, he evolved much of Rebetiko and the Laiko, which is popular music due to the strict censorship with the Laiko period, um, lasting from about 1942 to 1952. Um, so during this time, he really changed Rebetiko in itself. Um, he almost rids the genre completely of its shady connotations. Uh, this is largely due in part to, as he said, I did not uh, try to give a political tone to my songs, simply situations, sad or happy moments, pain, poverty, unhappiness, and the trials of the unfortunate are the subject of my songs that struck a chord with people. So he really um, brought a huge change in Rebetiko to where it really started to be a different genre in itself from um, what it had originally been. Around the same time, he also saw Manolis Hiotis. Um, he was originally a guitar player who played for uh, Vasily Tsitsanis. So um, he had a major um, Rebetiko influence as well. Um, he had a major influence on the bazooki itself. During this time, he was the one who added the fourth uh, course to the bazooki. And he changed the tuning, uh, making it more similar to that of a guitar, given his background in it. This ultimately made the instrument a lot more accessible to people uh, who already played guitar. And um, with the addition of a fourth string, or fourth course rather, um, it allowed for different chord shapes as well to start appearing on the instrument um, rather than just the normal triads, which you typically saw. Um, so he helped a lot with the Lyco movement as well. And um, during his time, he spent a lot of time in New York and it was often rumored that Jimi Hendrix would come watch Hiotis play in New York City. Um, really showing that how uh, some of this Greek music um, had an effect not only on the Greek population, but also on very respectable musicians worldwide. So um, eventually there was a bit of a decline of Rebetiko. As Rebetiko continued to move less and less uh, towards a controversial uh, state, um, it really changed to Lyco. Uh, many consider the mid 50s to be the death of Rebetiko due to, to the lack of uh, Rebetis um, with the improving economy and often with the allure of commercial success in which people weren't th just there to sing about their hardships anymore. Um, however, around the 60s, you started to see a little bit of a revival, uh, thanks to composers such as Manos Hadidakis and Mikis uh, Theodorakis, um, who used bazooki music and rebetiko influences in um, their movies in Never on Sunday and on uh, Zorba the Greek, uh, respectively. In both of these movies, um, they combined a lot of Greek, um, specifically rebetiko and lyco rhythms and scales and such. Um, but at the same time, as Haji Dakis had stated, um, Rebetiko only existed when it was illegal, played in inaccessible hiding places somewhere on the fringe. So self-admittedly by themselves, they agreed that while, of course, this did have a lot of the same influences, um, it truly wasn't Rebetiko. Um, and Rebetiko has never truly been the same since then. Uh, a bit later on, in 1967 to 1974, a military junta um, took over Greece. Um, and during this time, they outlawed Rebetiko music once again, seeing it as immoral uh, due to the more conservative government. Um, however, to a lot of the population, Rebetiko actually started getting a little bit of popularity because it was seen as a music of resistance against the authoritarian leaders. Um, and then much after this, at the fall of the junta into the 80s, um, Rebetiko started becoming uh, a lot more widely accepted as a form of music and as kind of a representation of Greek culture. People started to really respect it, um, kind of seeing it as a representation of all the hardships that the people um, had taken throughout their lifespans. Now that brings us to Rebetiko today. Um, currently, it's passed down through oral tradition and taught in many music schools and some universities. Kevin, I think your sound cut out. 
a lot of um, there you are. Okay. Greek restaurants here, and you can completely um, hear this music there. Um, however, a lot of Rebetico has yet to be truly decriminalized, uh, decriminalized through court proceedings. Um, a lot of people who, of course, got ar arrested for previously doing um, playing Rebetico have technically not been exonerated. Um, so, while that is still kind of an issue, Rebetico is widely accepted within the culture still, and there is a movement to completely get rid of these uh, connotations. Um, a lot of Arbetico today is even taught in places as far um, as Japan, as my mentor told me. Um, additionally, you have large Greek populations, of course, in Melbourne, um, in New York, and in Ohio. Um, all of these places are still continuing a lot of these traditions, including the Hellenic Underground, which is my mentor's own personal project in which he is working to uh, revive the genre as a whole, creating new music as well as a celebration of the old. Um, you see a lot of influences on other music as well from this genre. Um, for example, uh, Dick Dale's Miserloo was originally a Rebetico song that he covered. Um, much of surf rock as a whole has a lot of roots um, in somewhat of this genre, as well as a lot of Greek and music, and mu Greek music and music from this area. Lots of similar scales, such as uh, heat saws and rhythms. Um, Philux as well, uh, he was a guitar player for Tommy Lee, and most recently he's been the guitar player for Bon Jovi. Uh, he's actually a Greek bazooki player in his free time, which has actually influenced a lot of his work. Um, and in addition, the Irish actually created their uh, own version of the Greek bazooki, I believe, around the mid-century, um, in which they kind of mixed it more with a uh, guitar body style, uh, flattening it out. And um, they tuned it more similar to a mandolin, which kind of suited their uh, musical needs more. Now, as for my actual project, um, I had a few challenges. One of the big ones was finding sources on the subject. It was not well recorded in history, um, especially in English. Oh. Um, this is largely due in part to how niche of a music genre it is to the Greek culture, in addition to um, how difficult it is to actually find, um, or how difficult it was to actually get um, recordings of a lot of the stuff um, through various years of censorship and um, due to kind of the negative connotations it often had, it wasn't recorded as well in history. Uh, but I overall overcame this through um, just doing, having a full year to do research, looking through countless different sources, and of course through a lot of help through um, my mentor himself. Um, he helped me a lot with um, finding a lot of these sources, of course, from his own work in this. Um, additionally, uh, it was hard to find people at first in the US who are familiar with Rovetico and the Bazooki. Uh, just given how um, unique it is to the Greek culture. Um, it took me a while, but honestly, thanks to Mr. Boats, um, he recommended that I contact Berkeley College of Music, and they were able to set me up with someone immediately, um, who happened to be my mentor. Um, so that was very lucky in itself, especially considering he is the um, first bazooki player at Berkeley College of Music. Um, so very fortunate that everything turned out well that year with that. Um, additionally, it was nice as well. Um, through uh, the recommendation from Mr. Boats to talk to George Youngblood. He has actually worked on bazookis in the past. So um, that was also another helpful resource, uh, at least with getting maintenance on bazooki and seeing how they were made. Um, another issue actually, let me switch over. Here we go. Um, my bazooki had a little bit of poor construction. Uh, just due to the lack of a truss rod in it, which typically helps to straighten up the neck and keep it from warping. Um, the climate here is a lot different than, of course, in Greece, so um, the humidity ended up having a toll on this, and as you can see, uh, the string action got really, really high. Um, that kind of made it really hard to play, especially chords. Um, but I've overall just powered through that, and I am hoping to get a new bazooki sometime soon, uh, just to continue my playing with that. And then let me switch back. All right. Finally, another big issue was time. Um, I have been a teacher this entire year. I've had six AP tests and I am also a rower. So sometimes I felt the time was um, a little bit of a hard thing to find for this, but I ultimately found it um, just at, at times like after school in between practice or um, typically on the weekends, I would play a decent amount of research, um, which really helped me to just keep up with this. And it was more of a fun activity for me too, considering I just love playing and I have really enjoyed 
um, learning a lot of the instruments. So while time was an issue at the same time, it was an um, enjoyable time to spend my time. So um, as for a final reflection, um, I really was able to learn a lot about a style of music and how to play an instrument um, that of course are both rare outside of Greece. Um, that kind of really fostered a lot of cultural connections. I was able to learn a lot more about the Greeks' perspectives on a lot of things. I was able to see a completely different perspective uh, than from what you typically see as a tourist. Um, I was able to feel like I was almost able to become like partially Greek myself, um, which was like kind of a really cool experience. You really see a lot of parts of their culture that are completely different from what you typically see, like on your typical tour bus in Greece or anything. So um, I really enjoyed being able to foster that in a lot of the cultural relations, um, especially given my major being international relations, which of course, um, a lot of that is gonna be central to my future um, education. I would also like to give a special thanks to Konstantinos Ravelis, my mentor. He helped significantly. I would not have been able to do this project without him, whether it be finding sources or specifically through lessons. I would never have been able to learn this instrument without him. I would like to thank Mr. Boats, my advisor. Um, he helped me, of course, numerous times with finding contacts and just general advice. And I would like to thank Mrs. McDonald for uh, giving me the opportunity to have this um, entire project. Um, it was really an enlightening experience and I am completely happy with how it turned out. Now, as a final note, I would just like to um, play a video of a recording of myself playing the bazooki. Um, this is a snippet of uh, the song uh, Frago Siriani by Marcos Vamacaris. It's one of his most famor uh, famous about um, a Franco-Syrian girl. Um, so a girl from Syros um, with uh, French origins um, in the Roman Catholic sector of that um, island. So here you go. All right, so that concludes my presentation. Um, overall, I really enjoyed this entire experience and I would really, again, like to thank everyone for everything they've been able to um, help me with for this presentation as well as for coming to watch it. Amazing job, Kevin, really, really impressed. It sounds like it was an extremely rewarding experience for you. Um, I know the capstone project was something that you were toying with at the beginning of the school year and I'm really happy that you saw it through because it seems like it was an extraordinary experience for you. It really was. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, I have to just say that I'm impressed, like you said, with taking on all of your courses and all your AP courses and taking this on in addition to it, learning the guitar. Um, I know that it was not an easy task, so I'm just very impressed. Thank you so much. For those of you who are tuning in, you can use the chat feature of Zoom to make comments and questions, and I could read those aloud for you. Our first one is from Rose. Great job, Kev. 
Thank you, Rose. This is from Jim Revkin. Bravo, well done. Thank you so much, Dr. Revkin. Uh, Mr. Boats, tremendous job, Kevin. Thanks so much. And Karen said, good job, Kevin. Thank you, Mom. And um, Zach said, awesome, Kevin. <laughs> So Thanks again. You, you all really, really enjoyed it. And thank you for sharing this with us. It, it was wonderful. The presentation, the history, the performance was all excellent. Thank you so much. Do you think you'll continue to, to play with it and, and use it? I'm completely planning to. I'm planning on buying a new bazooki for myself um, sometime in the near future to continue a lot of this. Uh, yeah, this, this is definitely something I'm going to continue with me for the rest of my life. Good. Well, you have to find some space in that dorm room at BU for it, right? Exactly. <laughs> All right. Nice job, Kevin. Um, 